Good morning. How you guys doing? Good. We're going to be in Matthew 6 this morning. If you're one of those people who likes the ancient thing called paper, um, if not, that's okay. Maybe you got it on your phone. It'll be behind me on this big screen anyway. If you don't want to do any of that, that's okay. Matthew 6, 5 through 15. The text is called the Lord's Prayer. It's called the Lord's Prayer because the Lord is talking to his disciples, and his disciples ask the Lord to teach them how to pray. They ask Jesus, teach me how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And Jesus first contextualizes who we are as we pray, and then he teaches them this beautiful poetic prayer that even if I did 12 series on this in a row, even if we preached through the Lord's Prayer for a year, I wouldn't be able to throw a dart at the the amazingness of this prayer. Uh, The Lord's Prayer is the centrality of both God's heart and his mission. It's somehow epic and intricate all at the same time. It's somehow ethereal and big and massive, and yet a child could grasp it. A guy named Ron Hutchcraft says, the Lord's Prayer moves from galaxies to groceries. That's how, that's how big and how intricate at the same time this prayer is. Laura Copley says this about the Lord's Prayer. She's a theologian in Grand Rapids. Uh, Michigan, the one with a bunch of people. Not Ohio, where I don't know what's going on down there. It goes like this. One of the great problems we have in preaching this text is that it's too great. Every word is a diamond in every facet of sermon. Like many treasures, priceless and wonderful, think family, water, education, life itself. We take it for granted. We yawn. We run through the to-do list while intoning the words of the Lord's Prayer on autopilot. Laura also tells this, words, uh, this story about the, this church in, at the end of uh, World War II. There's this pastor. His name was uh, Helmut Felix, and he's leading a church At the end of Germany's reign of terror, there's still bombs and sirens at their doorstep all the time. As a matter of fact, they start a series in the Lord's Prayer in their church building, and they have to move to a house because their church is bombed. And so picture the worst of war happening all around them, and this is what Pastor Helmut says about the Lord's Prayer. Yet for all this chaos and despair, the Lord's Prayer was able to contain it all. There was not a single question we could have not brought to it, and not one question that was not suddenly transformed if it were put in the form of a prayer for a congregation desperate for a valid comfort. Remember, they're in war. Able to stand up to a world where the furies had been unleashed, the gospel contained in the Lord's Prayer became that very comfort. That's the Lord's Prayer. It's that big, it's that epic. At the same time, God just wants you to walk in this morning and realize that this is the same as a father teaching his son or teaching his daughter how to fish. Just hold the line like this. Just cast it like this. So many of, the, many of us in this room, and I think it's probably going to be most of us, are not comfortable with our prayer life. This is, by the way, Siri has literally been doing this for the whole part of the first sermon, the, the little bubbles being like this. Um, Brent, I need like your, your thing. Brent, Brent's so good at Apple, but it's, anyways. Um, no, okay. Uh, here, here, here's, what, here's what God wants for you this morning. If you feel like you, you, can't, you can't pray, you don't know how, you're not good enough, your performance is poor, you're stuck, he just wants you to pray what the disciples prayed. Lord, teach me to pray. That's it. There's no condemnation in here. There's no shame around this. Just pray what I pray. Lord, teach me to pray. Close your eyes with me. Lord, we feel often inadequate in our prayer lives. Even though I'm supposedly some professional pastor at this deal, I often feel inadequate and ashamed that my prayer life is not deep. It's not wide enough. It's not often enough. And so we, like children, like sons and daughters, just come into your presence, and we ask the Father, Lord, teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, here it goes, like this. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Jesus is going to set up this poetic prayer with giving us kind of the boundaries of who we're supposed to be as we pray. 
God will always be, and I've said this here before, God will always be more concerned with who we are as opposed to how we perform. He's more concerned with who you are as a child of God than he is your output. He's, he cares more about your heart than your activity. Your identity is more important than your activity. A, a guy named Dallas Willard puts it this way. Spiritual formation, which means the formation of your insides, the formation of your spirit, your soul, who you are in Christ. Spiritual formation is not about behavior modification. That's often what we try to do, right? We want the insides of our soul to be deeper and stronger and more intimate with God, and so we try to change our behavior. Let me get rid of this addiction. Let me, do, let me pray harder. Let me pray more. It's not about, it's not about uh, behavior modification. It's about changing the sources of behavior. So the behavior will take care of itself. In other words, like Jesus tells the, the religious leaders, first he, he calls them fools, and then he says, first clean the inside of the cup, and then the outside will also be clean. Let the Spirit take care of your insides. Be formed on your insides before you worry about your behavior on the outsides. So God is more concerned about your insides, who you are, before what you do. All right? You'll always be an inside-out human. God created you inside-out. So he talks to them first, and he says, first, who I don't want you to be as you pray is a hypocrite. Greek word, hypocrite. Same word for stage actor. Okay? I don't want you to be a stage actor. These people out here, they're like stage actors. In the same way, they immerse themselves in some different personality. They put on a costume. They put on a mask. That's what they do when they pray. God doesn't want that from you. And he doesn't want that from you, not just because, you know, you should be ashamed of, uh, of being a hypocrite. He wants that because he wants an intimate relationship with all of you. He wants you to come exactly as you are. Broken, come broken. Broken. Lost come lost, needy come needy, joyful come joyful. Whatever you are in that moment, God does not want you to perform for him or put on a mask or put on a costume or immerse yourself in a different personality to impress somebody else or him. He just wants you. If you're addicted, come, come addicted. C come to the king. Lost. Um, this is... This is a, a problem that's happening for the religious Pharisees because, uh, and by the way, they're just kind of the religious rulers of the day because they're coming not just fake to Jesus or fake to God, uh, but they're coming for this reason. For they love to stand and pray in synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. They're kind of the religious peacocks, the religious Conor McGregors of the faith, right? They're, they're walking around. They want to prove themselves to others. They don't want to spend time in the presence of God just to spend time with their father. They want to spend time in the presence of God so that people put a little check mark on their religious chore chart. They need credit. Jesus says, not so you. No, 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 no. Just, just come as you are. But when you go, this is, he's talking to us now. He's talking to the disciples, the people who are asking. When you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who's in secret. Now, he's not talking about, because we just prayed in public. So you're like, did we just sin? No, we didn't just sin. Okay, he's talking about your heart still. Make your heart as private as possible as authentic and as intimate as possible. They did this thing back in the day where they, they developed a tallet. It was a, a prayer scar, uh, scar for Shaw. I just saw him in the airport the other day. We still have tallets. And the Jewish people, because maybe they didn't have a room to go into, they would wrap this tallet over their head and they would pray in private because they wanted to be intimate. They wanted to close out the world and just spend time with their God. Uh, John Wesley's mom, John Wesley's a famous evangelist, famous dead guy. Uh, his, his mom had eight kids, which is a lot, and, and they, had a, they were poor. They had a small, small house. And so what she would do when she was cooking is she would drape her apron over her head. And her kids knew, mom's praying, and I'm not going to get food if I bother her, right? But what, that's just what God's telling you to do. Just, just find your privacy. Why? Because you make it cheap when it's public all the time, right? It just becomes cheap. If you've been in a relationship with anybody, even if you're, you're married or you've dated somebody, if every single thing that you do has to be publicized on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, every single thing that you do for them becomes that, it loses its mustard. Like if everything I did for Anne, my wife, 
was, okay, I, 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 got, I got her this, this spontaneous gift and I had to put it online. The moment that I put it on, online, I, take, I, I make it cheap. So, so God says, I, I want you to do this in private. I want you to, to go into your room and pray as much as possible. Make this private and intimate and authentic. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. We have these two. We have these filler, these filler words, and we, we, we go on and on, and you, I mean, you're hungry, you just have a sandwich in front of you, and you ask this guy who thought he was supposed to be a, prayer to, a pastor to pray, you're like, can you pray, John? And you're like, oh, that was the wrong person to ask, and here he goes. All you want to do is eat your sandwich. And he, the Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end. Up and down. You just, bro, just pray. Just please thank God for the sandwich, okay? He, d- he doesn't need all this. He doesn't need this stage acting. Or we do this thing where we, we pray what we can call the cover the bases prayer. You ever do this? Because you're worried that, God, that you're going to miss a base. So you're praying for a test, and you're like, God, would you bless number one? God, would you bless number two? And you go on and on, covering all of your bases. God says, not so you. I know your heart. Let me teach you how to fish. I know your heart. Don't act. Don't perform. Don't be disingenuous. Just sit with your father in private and offer your heart. That's the context of this. In the end, prayer is not about the right information. It's not about the right information. It's not about your performance. It's about you desperately connecting to your father exactly as you are. It's that simple. How then do we pray? How then? So he gave us, I don't want your heart to look like this. I don't want your relationship with me to look like this. I want it to be real. I want it to be authentic. I want it to be private. I want want it to be intimate. That's who you should be as you pray. How then should you pray? Pray then like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your, father and, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's a beautiful poem. My son uh, just turned 11 a couple weeks ago, my second child. Uh, he's been the best. He's raising his hand. That's me. He's such a great kid. And I know, I know that may be annoyingly biased to say in front of a group of people, um, but one, he's going to go to middle school next year, and middle school is the worst. All right? So when daddy's in public, daddy's going to say good things about him. Amen? Because other people won't. Um, sorry, son. They're just brutal. Number two, he has been the best. I mean, he came out early. He was just the easiest kid. I mean, we, we'd, we'd be tired. We'd put him down to sleep. He'd go, oh, it's time for that? Boom. And he just deuces. And then he'd wake up, and he would just stare at the ceiling and coo. I mean, I don't, I don't know any other parent that dealt with a kid like this. This is who JD has been. Uh, and he's just been cool as a cucumber ever since. All right, Tommy and Top Gun. This guy has just been easy like Sunday morning, Okay. Uh, if you've met him, you know I'm not, I'm not just making this up. He's just, he's just a good kid. Um, and, and when he was about four or five years old, they were wondering about his pace of growth. All right, they do this with all sorts of kids. And he ended up being fine. But because, because of his pace of growth, they were like, uh, you know what, we're going to have to give him a test every week for a month. All right, so they got to stick him with needles every week for a month and draw blood. Now, if there's anything worse than getting you know, stuck with a needle... It's watching your kid get stuck with a needle, right? So I don't know what it is about this moment, but every time I'm watching a doctor stick my kid with a needle, I just daydream about giving them a knuckle sandwich. I don't, like, I understand that it's, my, it's me, I'm, I'm a sinner, saved by grace, and I need to pray over these things. I know the doctor's just doing their job, but I just want to give them a knuckle sandwich. So I'm, I decide, look, I'm going to go with him for all of these, these shots, because I know what he's thinking, because it's what we all would think. I know his mind is going out of control. Daddy, why do I have to do this? Daddy, is this going to hurt as much as last time? Daddy, how come I'm not growing like the other kids? Right? This is what happens when we're going into hard places. 
Our mind has the, the endless capacity to wander into those dark places. So I knew his mind would wander, and I thought, okay, let daddy go with him, because daddy's just a bit stronger and hairier in nature. It's a good thing. Praise the Lord. God made us different, despite what the culture says. All right? I, I'm going to go, and he's going to look at daddy. Right? And I told him, you look at me. I told him, you can grab me. You can dig your nails into my arm. You can do, we're going to get ice cream after this, even if it's 8 a.m. This is what's going to happen, right? And I'm just focusing him. Now, now, here's what's going on. His mind, his heart is going off center. I'm trying to bring him back center. His mind is wandering. I'm trying to bring him back home. His mind is running amok, and he's going to get nervous and anxious, as we all would. It would go into dark places. So I'm saying, come, come back home. Look at, look at your father in the eyes. Just come right back home. And there's a number of ways that we can look at the Lord's Prayer. We, I, I've taught this a number of different ways, as a matter of fact. But two timeless truths just jumped off the page when I read the Lord's Prayer. Number one is that we have this endless capacity to wander as humans. We have this endless capacity, like my son getting a shot, to let our mind go into dark places, to let our, our bodies, our minds, our spirit go into dark places and wander away from God. It was this great hymnist, it's one, maybe, the, maybe the most famous hymn of all time, at least for our generations, Come Now Fount, that, that says it like this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That's what we're prone to do. We're not prone to stay in the center with Jesus. We're not, we're not prone to stay right here. We're prone to prodigal and wander into all sorts of faraway lands and get ourselves in trouble and be anxious about tomorrow and be worried about what's going to happen next. And, and we're, we're, we're prone to let temptation lead us astray. This is who we're prone to be. We're prone to be broken. So that's one truth. The second truth is this. The Father's always beckoning us to come back home, to look him in the eyes, to come back center, to stop wandering. And this is Jesus going, I want you to come home every day. I know we've used this prayer and we say it before football games or baseball games or we, we've made it more event driven than we're supposed to. This is Jesus giving us each facet each diamond, stay, saying, look, you're prone to wander in this way. Come back home today on Monday. You're prone to wander in this way on Tuesday. Come back home. And again, you don't have to do a bunch of things. You don't have to perform. You don't have to do 40 days of this or get a devotional or kick that habit. That's not where you start. Where you start is just sit with your father in a secret place and come home every day. That's it. Forgive someone, not just in a grand, by the way, that's like the, the fourth one, not just in this grand gesture. Every time you forgive someone, don't let it be some big thing and it happens once every six months and you're in tears at the cross and that's because Brent led us through communion. Don't let it be that. Let it be every day, your morning walk. Forgive that person, at least try to. I tried to this morning. I failed, I think, but I was working on it. All right, you know when you're like, I forgive you. Oh, you know, it's like sort of. But I'll come back tomorrow. This is what God meant this for. So let's, let's look at it this way. Uh, we have this, this ability to wander. We're prone to wander. But this is the Father bringing us back home. Each facet goes like this. Here's the first one. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy or separate or other, be your name. Just, it's, just, it's just so big, it's separate from everything we think of. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first one, God says, look, wake up in the morning and locate God and locate yourself. Locate God, locate yourself. Because here's how we wander. We wander by forgetting where God is and who he is. Where we are and who we are. Okay? We just forget it. We forget that God is sitting on a throne of thrones. He's a king of kings. He's a lord of lords. And we forget, he starts, our father, our Abba. We forget that he's father, that he loves us like a child, and he's not going to harm us. And if he says no, he's saying no because he loves us. We forget these things. We forget who he is and where we are and where he is and who we are. We forget these things. So he said, locate it. 
first. Like, it's kind of like a mall map. I don't know if any of you, anybody else hate mall maps? All right, all right, okay, I put my hand up. We got a couple, of, like at least a little bit of this. All right, yeah. I hate mall maps. First of all, because I'm always lost. I always lose my family. It doesn't matter what place, they're gone. I don't know where they are, and no one's phone is to be found, okay? Costco's the worst, all right? I tweeted the other day, I'm like, there needs to be a zone in Costco for lost husbands. <laughs> huh? Just five couches, some TVs, a $1.50 hot dog. We'll be fine. Come get us. We won't cry, okay? But this is, I always get lost. And so I go to these mall maps, and now they're interactive, and they have ads, and you touch it, and it doesn't even work, okay? They, they got even worse. Here's what you do at a mall map. Just learn from my pain and suffering. First, you need to locate you are here. Little icon, little unisex icon. It's usually yellow or something, all right? You are here. And then you need to locate your destination. If you try to locate your destination first, if you try to find a store and you're trying to go through the list of 500 stores, you're a mess. But if you locate first, here's where I am and here's where I'm supposed to go. You'll be fine. And this is what Jesus is saying. Every single day, you need to wake up and locate where God is and who he is first. Because we're prone to wander. Here's how you know you're wandering. You're either overly anxious or fearful, or you're overly aggressive with God or audacious. Let's start with the first one. You're overly audacious and aggressive with God. We get overly audacious. God, I prayed for a house. Huh? I've been praying for three days for a house, and the interest rates are still 95.7. I wanted a used car, and it's $60,000 for a used car. And we just start coming at God. I prayed for healing. Are you a healer? Do you even care? Isaiah, Isaiah says, by his stripes we're healed. Was that even true? You know, we just start getting audacious with God, don't we? I do this all the time. And that's how you know you forgot to locate where he is. Locate that he's holy, he's big, he's on a throne, he's father, he cares, and he can also say no. He reserves the right to say no. So I tell my kids that all the time. I reserve the right to say no. Why? Because I got 30 plus years on you and I just know better. Sometimes I don't, I don't, have, all, I don't, have, a, I don't have six paragraphs to explain to you why this is a no. Maybe I should, and my wife thinks you should be more patient. Okay, maybe I should, but I'm, I'm going to say no, and I'm going to say no often because I love you and I care for you, right? I'm not one of these parents, these new agey parents, okay? No is a harsh word. All right, okay. Well, I'm going to say it tomorrow, okay? Because I know that they're not supposed to do that, and it's going to hurt them. They're going to be in pain. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt their soul, their heart, their mind, their body, so I'm going to say no all the time. It's inappropriate. It's appropriate. Yeah. Say no. Amen. So we get either uh, overly audacious with God, and he doesn't have the right to say no anymore, or we get overly fearful. Right? Something happens at work, at, at our job, uh, something, something might happen tomorrow, and we're overly anxious. Again, we're forgetting where he sits. That his throne is not made of butter. He, he knew that this thing was going to happen. It's not that he slid off. It's not that he forgot where you were. It's not that he forgot where your location was. It's that you're forgetting where your location is and where his is. So locate God first. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Next one. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's the second way we wander. Most days we wake up and we're not praying for God's kingdom to come. We're praying for our own kingdom to come. Like if we are a product of our own heart, I wake up in the morning and I don't pray your kingdom come. My heart prays, my kingdom come, my will be done now, like right now. That's my heart. And if you're like me, maybe some of you are like me, we have this kind of self-inner drive. Like I wake up in the morning and my, my mind is like a Nike commercial. There's like little people doing power ropes in my mind. Right? I'm, I'm going to slay 94 meetings. I'm going to plant 64 churches. I'm going to take 34 kids to soccer practice, and the day's going to be mine. That's how I wake up. All right? And none of these things are bad innately. At the same time, I'm not waking up and going, God, your kingdom come. Who do you want to love? 
Who do you want to care about? Who are you trying to reach today? What are you trying to build today? And here's a few ways you know. Uh, One way is that you're not building um, God's kingdom, but you're trying to build an American nation. And I'm going to wander slowly into this because you don't sprint into a minefield. Um, Only the pastor got that joke. Uh, Sweating already. Okay, here's the thing. We are a kingdom of God citizen first. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, first above all else. That's who we are. No matter where we live, what country we live in, and what, what we're trying to do, we are a kingdom of God citizen first. We are a child of the king, and he is building his kingdom. And his kingdom was being built before America was even here. And it's going to be here long after America is here. So I know this this feels kind of crazy, but let me put it this way. One thing is informing the other. Either your kingdom citizenship, the fact that you're a child of God, your citizenship in his kingdom, is going to inform your politics, or your politics is going to inform the kingdom that you're building. It's one or the other. And, and, And here's how you know that that's true. Uh, it's true in who you have decided to love. So you know if you're getting out of control, if you're, if you're idolizing your politics over the kingdom, if you've decided that you're going to pick and choose who you are going to love. Because Jesus was super clear about this. Right? They asked him, how, wrap up the entire law and all of its prophets. Go ahead. Jesus, if, if you were to summarize the law, how would you do it? Jesus goes, I got you. I'm going to wrap up hundreds of laws in the Old Testament and all the prophets and every single thing that they said. I'm going to wrap it up in two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then they tried to get him again. They're like, okay, who's my neighbor? And he says, I got you. And he picks a Samaritan to be the, 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 the healer of the story, the person that wins, the person that does everything else. He says, go love like them. And who was a Samaritan? A half-breed immigrant neighbor who didn't vote like they voted, who didn't care like they cared. So if you find yourself going, you know what? My politics lead me to love not that person, but that person. They voted like this, I don't love them. They're from this nation, I don't love them. Now your politics are informing your kingdom. Rich Velotis, uh, uh, one of my favorite preachers and pastors, puts it this way. The church is not to be found at the center of a left-right political world. The church is to be a species of its own kind. That's good. Call us aliens, right? And God calls us aliens. Church is not to be found at the center of a left-right political world. The church is to be a species of its own kind, confounding left, right, and so-called middle, because there's no such thing, really, and finding its identity from the center of God's life. That's who we are. We're aliens. We're different. We're kingdom citizens. So when I tell people I'm not a, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a, a, a libertarian, I saw a tweet the other day. It said, we should not call it libertarian. We should call it librarian so that we could shush everybody. (laughs) Pretty good. Pretty good. When I tell people I'm not that, it's because I am something else. It's not because I don't... You you found me at Whiteford Middle the other day. I came home off the plane, and I still wandered my butt over to Whiteford Middle to, to, to vote. I was exhausted. But you'll find me prayerfully voting. You'll, you'll, I'm, I'm still a citizen of this world, too. But my, my citizenship of the king first informs everything else. So have you wandered in that way? Are you building God's kingdom? Are you building your own? Are you building an American nation? God says, come back. Just ask God. Build your kingdom today. Who do you love? Who do you want me to reach? Next one. And guys, I know this is going slow, but they're going to they're happen like this. It's going to happen. I promise. And we won't get to the last one. Uh, we're not, we're not going to get to the uh, temptation one, but it's okay. You can pray that in your own time. All right. Uh, next one. 
Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Here's what Jesus is coming back to. He's coming back to the book of Exodus. Maybe you've read it. Maybe you haven't. That's okay. What happens in the book of Exodus is God brings his people out of slavery in Egypt. There's a guy named Moses. You've seen him on TV. He's got a giant beard. He happens around Easter, okay? That's Moses. Moses brings them out. Maybe nobody else. Everybody's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Go watch it around Easter. It's from the 1950s, I think. I don't, I don't remember. Moses brings them out of slavery, and they complain because they're hungry. By the way, don't judge them. We all do the same exact thing. Every time we're hungry, we get weird, all right? So they get weird. They get hungry. They go to Moses. They say, we need, we, at least we had pots of food. Yes, we were slaves, but at least we had pots of food. So God hears their grumbling, and he sends them food. Now, it's important how God sends them food. He sends them bread, matzah, a form of bread, and he sends it to them daily. So they have enough to go outside their tent and get just enough for their family for one day. If they try to, if they get greedy, if they go out there and they're grabbing a bunch of donuts, all right, they're like, I'm going to get tomorrow's donuts. I'm going to get, I'm going to get the Boston creams. I've seen some of you out there. They're out there getting a little bit greedy. Okay. What happens? It spoils. What's he teaching them? What's he teaching? He's teaching them, you get today's bread. Because if you get tomorrow's and you get the next day's, because again, we're prone to wander. If you go grabbing at tomorrow's wisdom and next week's wisdom and next month, and, and this is what we do. I want to know, I want to know, look, to be frank, uh, my job, it changes every 12 years, okay? My boss changes, which means I potentially have to change and do something different, uh, all that stuff happens every, every 12 years. We're coming up on that 12th year, this, this April. I want to know what happens. I'm just like you. I want April's wisdom. And every day I wake up and my heart is to go, God, tell me what's going to happen. Am I going to be doing this or that? It's not mine. It's not mine. I'm not supposed to have it. Because if I did have it, first of all, I would do bad things with it. Second of all, I wouldn't need to trust, pray, seek, be patient, love, have peace, lead my family. I wouldn't need to do any of that. Jesus says, just pray for today's. We're too greedy for tomorrow's. He even puts it in Matthew 6, this this very same chapter. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Meaning, if, if your anxiety is about tomorrow, I'm not talking about clinical anxiety, I'm not talking about any of that. If you have anxiety about tomorrow, that's disobedient. You need to bring it to the king. You need to say, okay, just just give me today's bread. Let me be okay with today's bread. Uh, We wander in that way, and so we come back to Jesus by asking for today's bread. Uh, Last one for today. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our sins, our debts to other people, our debt to God, as we've also forgiven uh, those people who are, who are in debt to us, who have sinned against us. Remember, this is not for before a baseball game. This is for every day. So every day I employ you to take a walk, to go into a closet, to forgive those people around you who have wronged you. Every day I employ you to ask God for forgiveness for not just the big sins. Don't get caught up in oh, I, I had a, a, a terrible thought and I, I acted upon it yesterday. Okay, that's, but what about, the, what about the smaller everyday things? That moment that you didn't sacrifice for your wife like you could have. Uh, that moment where you didn't love, uh, lo- love your neighbor like you could have. That moment where God was opening up a, a door of conversation uh, with a neighbor about Jesus, and you were like, "I don't, I don't want to be ashamed of, Je- I want to be ashamed of Jesus. I can't talk to them about Jesus." Let's pray through all those things. Let's let's ask for forgiveness for all those things. Um, my buddy and I call it a vault. So I have a friend. Um, he he took over the church for us in West Michigan, and he's my accountability partner. He knows everything. Uh, if you ever want me to go down, just call that guy. I'm not going to give you his name. All right? He knows all my deepest, darkest. And so he knows when I am a little bit off. And he'll ask me, do you need to empty the vault? 
That's what he says to me. And that's what I say to him. So here's what we mean by the vault. When somebody wrongs us, maybe you're like me, maybe you're like us, when somebody wrongs us, we don't forgive them daily. We go shove it into the vault. Oh, you want to do that? I got you. And we go put it in the vault. And we store it up. We put it on a nice little shelf. We're like, I'll come back to that later. Somebody wrongs you again. You put it on a shelf in the vault. And you wonder why your kid asks you for ketchup and you blow up. Right? Your kid's like, can I get some ketchup? You're like, I don't have time for ketchup. Okay, the, the vault is full. You've stored up bitterness and anger and frustration and anxiety with yourself and the people around you. And now, because you didn't do anything about it, the vault opened and everybody's getting the contents of the vault. You understand? It's like a beach ball. You can, you can push it down. Someone wrongs you, someone messes with you, someone does something. You can push it down in the ocean. It's just going to fly up somewhere else. Right? So Jesus says, this is for you. Forgiveness is freedom. Every single day you can wake up and you can forgive somebody. And you can allow the forgiveness of God to bring freedom to your soul, to your heart. You can walk around. He doesn't want you walking around with all these burdens on your shoulders because you have hatred and bitterness and anger against yourself and other people. He wants you free. He wants you floating. Okay? It's okay. I got the gospel. I got the good news of Jesus Christ. That he died for my sins. He resurrected from the dead. He died for your sins. He resurrected from the dead. You are forgiven. I am forgiven. I'm not trying to make light of this. Maybe, maybe, maybe you got people that, I mean, they've wronged you for 15 years. I'm not, I'm not trying to make light of this and saying, uh, that takes real work. I'm not saying that, okay? I'm saying, forgive people and yourself every day. Here's what we're going to do. I believe in practicing this. Um, and this might make some of you uncomfortable. It's okay. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. But here's the first question, because what we're going to do is we're going to pray kind of a facet of this, uh, this message. Could you put up the slide with all of the scripture on there? Not all of it, but there's the slide with the actual prayer where Jesus says, pray then like this. Uh, and then he goes through the entire Lord's prayer. I'm going to ask you, are you willing to pray for somebody? And then you can raise your hand. And then I'm going to ask you, do you need prayer in one of these things? Um, do, you need, do you need to ask God for his kingdom to come? Because you've been asking for your own kingdom to come. Do you need to forgive somebody? Uh, do you need today's bread? Maybe you need, maybe you need God's provision. Whether it be physically or mentally or spiritually, you need God's provision. And so you raise your hand if you need prayer. And first, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you can pray for others. So first, raise your hand. Are you willing to pray for others?